1991. Uh, when the Communist Party of China was founded, to the 25th anniversary of the People's Republic of China in 1974. Um, and the stamps are a symbolic pictorial representation of the years between 1921 and 1974. And they show China not as it really was, but China as its founders and leaders wanted it to be and felt it ought to be, and were encouraging the people to act in this way. Um, so basically, the stamps are tiny propaganda posters. Um, a propaganda poster will reach a certain number of people in a certain small area, uh, but the stamps will travel hundreds and thousands of miles. They're seen by all sorts of people, even people who can't read, um, and of course, they will be collected by many people too. So they are an excellent way of uh, publicizing your regime or anything else that you want to publish up, publicize. So the stamps themselves, they came in a set of a dozen boxes, rather large boxes, and uh, they sat in my house for many years. And the, my husband said to me every now and again, when are we going to get rid of the stamps? So I would go to the committee and say, oh, what are we going to do about the stamps? Eventually, of course, we, we couldn't sell them because they were stuck on to a damask uh, backing. But eventually, National Museums of Scotland said that they would take them as long as we could find some provenance, which we did. And so the stamps were eventually handed over. If you want to see them, I think they're probably in store in the museum, not on display. Um, but they were rather large. They took up about uh, a cubic meter, I would think. Uh, and you can see in this, uh, so in the large flat boxes covered in this rather magnificent brocade, uh, and they opened like this, so like a booklet with just the two sides, so stamps on each side, with a kind of perspex, a see-through perspex cover to keep the stamps clean. And there you'll see the title page and one of the first stamps, the very earliest stamp. Um, and I think that's that one is the first anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic. And it's actually, it's a <coughs> size there. And it's a hand painted reproduction of the stamps. So it's not a printed reproduction. There are two or three printed reproductions in the set. So the stamps go from, uh, they go more or less historically, but not quite, so they're not quite chronological, um, but they do work from top to bottom in that they start with the national issues and they go right down through the party, the workers, etc, etc, uh, down to flora and fauna at the bottom. Uh, so this is one um, commemorating a uh, 10th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. Um, and you see it's the badge, it's the uh, emblem of the nation with the five gold stars on the red ground, sheaves of wheat, I think there's a, co and a cogwheel to represent industry um, and the symbolic uh, Tiananmen Square, which of course used to be a, an imperial symbol, but is now, well, I suppose you might say it's, an, it's, it's again an imperial symbol. Uh, anyway, the stamps are, they vary in the number on each page according to how many there were in the set and so on. Uh, but you can see that the sets vary in theme. So you've got the red flag, this is very, you know, this is um, the nation uh, flag waving, literally. Uh, and then you have below in the second row, you have the emblem uh, in various different colours. And then I'm sorry, you can't see these very well. The stamps are tiny. It was quite difficult to take pictures, especially on this sort of pale grey background. Uh, but these show historic places in the history of the Communist Party and the nation. So you have uh, the place in Shanghai where the Communist Party was founded, the place where they had their first conference, um, the buildings in Yan'an where they went at the end of the Long March and so on. The, picture, the, the stamps at the bottom are maybe more interesting. 
So here, this is um, uh, this is 50 years of the uh, the Communist Party of China, and you can see that it's a it's a triptych of three stamps, quite tiny, um, but it has a sort of panorama. Uh, you've got industry on the uh, on the left, and um, agriculture on the right. You can just see the terraced fields. In the centre, you have the great hall of the people, so bringing everybody together. And in the foreground, you have a representation of the Chinese people. Centrally, you have a worker, a peasant, and a soldier. So this was the popular triumvirate. Uh, this was the um, the people of China were represented in this triumvirate: workers, peasants, soldiers. Intellectuals came a very poor fourth or fifth, and of course merchants uh, were at the bottom of the pile. Um, you've also got uh, a large range of people in other work. So you've got a couple of industrial workers here and what look like uh, caterers or maybe sort of light industry workers here. You've got um, a party carder here, an administrator, probably a party member, and you've got people in their ethnic costumes. So China has 55 uh, minorities, ethnic minorities, the largest of which is the Han, which takes up 90%, um, but the ethnic minorities sometimes still wear their national costume. And uh, it's, they have been exploited hugely for music and art. Uh, this is uh, a woman casting her vote. So this is the National People's Congress. Uh, Chinese people had never had a vote before, uh, but now they had representatives. I mean, you still have this. People still vote uh, in the uh, People's Congress and the Party Congress. But of course, voting is somewhat different from the way we vote. And here's this um, worker casting her vote, a woman casting her vote note. Um, back to the workers. Um, this is a rather typical socialist realist image uh, of the smiling worker against um, a steaming industrial background. This is a very common style. You see it in many of you will have been to China. You will have seen the great socialist realist statues of uh, the really brawny people fighting for the re revolution. And you can see he's very muscly, very slim, and he has a huge smile. And he's also dressed quite stereotypically with his little scarf around his neck. Uh, a worker and a peasant always had a little scarf for wiping off the sweat. And here we've got more industry. So you've got heavy industry in the background. Uh, this was about learning from Da Qing, which was an oil field in the northeast of China. Um, and it was a model industry. Everybody was expected to learn from Da Qing and work in the Da Qing style in order to produce the nation. <clears throat> and here we have um, probably, a, I, I'm not quite sure what this is. Some of you may, may be able to see, but it's um, obviously some kind of uh, technological research. <clears throat> And here we have a range of industries, um, chemical, look, what looks like chemical industries. We've got somebody uh, mending or producing a tire tractor, uh, somebody inspecting fabric, um, somebody tapping barrels here. And I could not work out what this one is. I think it might be some kind of spray. Uh, the girl is wearing a, she's got a drum around her neck, which she appears to be winding so i'm not, not quite sure that what that is if anyone knows please help and here we have the countryside so top of the picture um the elderly man now you will see a pipe smoker again this was very symbolic of the old man at repose having done his work enjoying the fruits of a new china in the old China, he would have worked till he dropped, uh, but now he's allowed to take a bit of rest and so on. Um, and he's got his typical um, head wrap 
and he's wearing an old style Chinese jacket. Uh, the girls, on the other hand, you've got a young woman here who is a, a barefoot doctor. Uh, she's carrying her medical kit under her arm, and I'll say more about barefoot doctors later. And the, 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 the pink stamp is a young girl, and she's watering sunflower plants. Uh, sunflowers, the, the Chinese people were the sunflowers because they looked towards Chairman Mao, who was the sun. Uh, we've got more agriculture here. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, well, basically during the Cultural Revolution, young people, uh, intellectuals, and that included secondary school pupils as well as university students, were sent down to the countryside, literally. The, the Chinese expression is go down to the countryside. And the idea was that they learned from the peasants. So. Being intellectual was a slightly shameful occupation during the Cultural Revolution and you, you were sent to learn how to be a worker or a peasant. Um, I myself, as a student in China, uh, went down to the countryside to learn how real life happened. Uh, it was a most enjoyable experience, actually, um, <laughs> which um, I can tell you about later. Um, <clears throat> here we've got, uh, here the, we have two women working in a field. The, the one in the, the bluey colour is uh, an older woman, you can tell by her hairdo, her bun, and she is cutting, they're cutting sheaves of wheat. Uh, it might be sorghum, it's a rather stylized uh, depiction. The younger woman at the top with her short hair is a student, and she's learning from the older woman. Here we've got two men uh, sitting a young man, um, the old man again in his head wrap and his peasant jacket, and he appears to be teaching the young man about propagating plants. The young man his, has his notebook open on his knee. And again, this set, the same set. So on the left, we've got uh, two young people planting trees, and you can see in the background the sun, Chairman Mao shining on all that is China. This one I find very interesting, the one on the right, you've got three figures. Uh, the girl in pink is obviously a student and she's speaking to two men who are peasants. She's got the newspaper upside down to her and she's pointing to the sentences and I think she's either, she's probably teaching them to read. So what, this, what the intellectuals gave to the peasants and workers was intellectual knowledge, reading and writing, and probably med, things like medicine and basic science. And in, so now I'm sorry, these are not very clear because they're so small. And the top, the top image, again, you've got your old man with a pipe. These three pictures are what are known as Hu Xian paintings. Uh, there is an area not far from Xi'an, you may have, some of you may have been to Xi'an, where uh, they are known for their peasant art. They have this wonderful tradition of evening classes, a bit like the Pitman painters in the UK, um, where they, workers and peasants go to evening classes, learn how to paint, sometimes from templates. Um, and these, these pictures are now quite valuable. Sadly, many of them are done in poster paint on cartridge paper, and so they're rather ephemeral. I have one, but it's a shame the, the poster paint is dropping off. Um, so we've got the, the old man with his pipe um, relaxing. He looks to me as if he's reading a party, a party publication. Um, in the middle, now I'm not an engineer, I think this is either, it's either mining or it's digging a well. Again, somebody please help me on this. Um, and here we've got a meeting, a probably a political meeting in the countryside. In the 1960s and 70s, you had to go to endless meetings, struggle meetings, party meetings, planning meetings, all sorts, a bit like we do today. Um, <clears throat> These stamps 
two stamps, and I think it's a series of four, actually, stand out as being very different in design. These are quite westernised designs, and I think, to me, they're somewhat rem reminiscent of the the scientific style we had in the 1950s with the Festival of Britain. A uh, sort of, you know, I don't know if you remember, but the molecule-based molecule fabrics and so on. A uh, very interesting, very modern style, which doesn't, which seems to disappear. Actually, it it didn't seem to be sustained. Um, another thing which is featured is the great uh, engineering project. So China, China is a huge country. It's got very difficult terrain in many places, and some of the feats of engineering have been quite remarkable. Here you've got um, a bridge, a viaduct over a steep gorge, and also on the right, the Red Flag Canal, which went along almost unbelievable, implausible um, terrain. Um, moving on to politics, this is international politics. In 1971, there was a, a ping pong tournament which resulted rather indirectly in Nixon's visit to China in 1972. And here you've got a um, Chinese girl in a blue shirt, um, a rather, a, um, I don't know whether the guy in the middle is uh, European or maybe, maybe Japanese, it's not very clear. Um, obviously someone who's Asian, someone who looks like he might be South American in the back and a distinctly Nordic looking person as well. And so China was coming out of a period of isolation, relative isolation. It was very difficult to go into China or come out um, between 19, the mid 1960s and the mid 1970s. And China gradually began to open up after 1972. And this is a series on sports. Uh, you can see the peasants um, in their, <clears throat> having their tug of war. I have no idea what the other team looked like. Uh, and then you've got, uh, rather, you've got some upsailing or um, rock climbing going on. These people are dressed in green and I think they're the army. I think uh, ordinary people would have been discouraged from rock climbing. Um, they probably wouldn't have the time anyway, unless they had to do it. Uh, you do sometimes see wonderful photos of children scaling mountains in order to get to school in various remote parts of China. Now, the gymnasts. The gymnasts and the acrobats are distinctly unusual in China. We all know Chinese acrobatics and gymnastics now. They are world beaters. Uh, they, they win all the Olymp many of the Olympic titles that the Russians don't. Uh, but it was unique in that it was the only opportunity for Chinese people to see a human body. Uh, the, the style motif for most of the 20th century was baggy and dull coloured. But gymnasts and acrobats were allowed to take their clothes off and look sexy, ballet dancers too. And it was also acrobatics and gymnastics is wordless and so it carries no propaganda of course we know now that it does have a soft power role but um, you could go to an acrobatic show you can be an acrobat without showing any kind of political leanings and it was a safe thing to do a safe entertainment um, back to the stamp, so here's the GPO, you, you cannot exclude the post office when you're talking about stamps, and there is a, one of the uh, items in the collections is a, a little stamp, well there's two or three stamps actually, but this one shows the postie on her bike, and she's got the People's Daily, she's delivering the People's Daily. Now interesting, this one is uh, an A4 sized paint, hand painted reproduction. They were hand painted in every set of these stamps because it was cheaper than reproducing things in colour. Um, and this is the actual stamp uh, as it appeared on the letter. 
Um, here you've got um, a set about teachers. So teachers were intellectuals, but it was recognised that they were highly necessary, partly because China needed to um, improve literacy. So throughout the middle of the 20th century, uh, literacy was big. Um, particularly, in, for example, in language reform, uh, there were major language reforms which helped literacy in China. Um, so you've got the teach at the top, we have the teacher at home doing her marking. And then here you have the teacher in school. Uh, this one is a, I'm sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy, uh, but this is a teacher on the ho with a horse. She's going out to probably to the northwest, um, the Xinjiang, uh, Mongolia areas where people lead a nomadic um, mounted life. And they sent teachers out to these areas. It's not always easy to get school together. Um, it's a bit like teaching travellers and Romanies in Europe. And the one at the bottom, again, it's a teacher teaching children in a boat. So she's going out to the boat people, uh, probably in southeast China. And here we have the barefoot doctor who was enormously important in the mid 20th century. China was very poor then, it could not afford drugs. Now it's sending medical supplies to the rest of the world, uh, but then it had very little in the way of Chinese of medicine. And so it relied very heavily on traditional herbal medicine. And this was promoted by Chairman Mao. If you read articles on Chinese medicine, which date from that period, and even now, people will say Chairman Mao promoted Chinese medicine. Um, so we have the barefoot doctor. Uh, she's there. She is um, on the left. Uh, she is inoculating children. Very, very important. Lots of nasty diseases. Um, and I think encephalitis at that period was a major problem in China. But there were all sorts of other things going around. And here we have the barefoot doctor crossing a stream in stormy weather. Uh, here she's gathering, she's with a peasant gathering herbal remedies. Um, not all Chinese medicine is herbal. There are mineral and uh, animal products used as well. And here she's uh, tending to um, someone who's uh, been taken ill or had an accident uh, at the edge of a field. So the barefoot doctor was very important. Um, uh, this, this, is, um, this is the woman. So there was a slogan at the time, women hold up half the sky. Uh, so women were equal, considered equal with men at that time. There was quite a lot of childcare. There were creches. Um, every, Factories and communes had a crash, and so you sent your child off to school. Or, or granny would look after the child, and um, the woman would go to work. So here she is driving a tractor. Uh, here she is uh, harvesting. Here she's picking cotton. Uh, here you've got two women uh, gathering sunflower heads. Again, the symbolic sunflower. Um, this young woman is taking a break. Uh, and reading a communist party or a government um, leaflet. You can tell it's a government leaflet because it's white with a red cartouche. So all government uh, publications look like that. And here she's in the militia, doing her militia training. On to entertainment. Um, entertainment in the 1970s was rather restricted. Uh, you, basically, you had the model operas, which included a few films and a couple of ballets. And these were um, highly moral, improving propaganda plays, uh, which uh, showed the Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army as heroes, and showed landlords and the Japanese and Americans as evil perpetrators. Uh, so the one on the left is the story of the Red Lantern, uh, which takes place uh, on a railway, uh, in a railway situation. 
you can see these, um, these are pictures of propaganda teams. Propaganda teams were sent out to the countryside and factories uh, to um, entertain and educate peasants and workers. And so the, the man who's singing the Red Lantern arias is in an agricultural setting and he's got his little band sitting there with their traditional instruments playing for him. The ballet dance on the right is dancing in an industrial setting. This is a scene from the Red Detachment of Women. And when I saw this ballet in Beijing, I just, I thought I had never seen such long legs ever anywhere. Um, of course, it's partly the effect of the point shoes. It's the effect of the shorts, I think, which makes the legs look so long. But um, it is a magnificent ballet. And um, here we have the propaganda teams again. On the left, they're doing something called Dagu, which is a traditional entertainment. But of course, through the ages, it's been adapted as a propaganda tool. And it's always a man and a woman in a dialogic interchange. And finally, in this set, the, um, this is a woman in People's Liberation Army uniform of the 1930s and 40s, uh, and the, the grey uniform rather than khaki uniform with the parties. And she again, she's out there entertaining in the countryside. Uh, these are pictures from a film of another ballet, The White Haired Girl. Again, it's, it's very much in the, it's a propaganda uh, film. So we're getting to the end now. Um, and here we, so China, as you know, China now relies heavily on its history, or at least its, its tradition, for its soft power. Uh, so the way to sell Chinese culture in the world is through Chinese opera, Chinese music, um, Chinese archaeology. Archaeology is hugely important for China, um, and um, ancient Chinese science and so on. All the traditional in Chinese inventions are are very much emphasised in in Chinese international propaganda. So here we've got some very interesting artifacts. Uh, this one at the top is a drum cart which was used to measure distance, I think, 2,000 years ago. Um, so it's a sort of uh, tachograph, I suppose it was tachograph or a tachometer of, the, um, of ancient days. Obviously, it would be used by the emperor and probably not by anybody else. Um, here we have an ancient seismograph, uh, something which a uh, machine which uh, predicted, was said, to predict or measure earthquakes. And it was done with things like tilting cups of water, uh, nodding dragons, and so on. And then we have a very ancient um, piece of uh, pottery with, um, with a dragon design on. Uh, and these are carved bricks from the Han Dynasty, which have uh, those where the motifs are carved on bricks and tiles. <clears throat> and my last slide, so uh, the China, you can see the, the progression from the very simple engraved stamps at the beginning uh, to these beautiful full colour stamps at the end. And I think even between this one and the, the colour pictures of the propaganda teams, there is a difference in technology. China is gradually um, wealthier and modernizing and this all started in about 1972 it began to open up uh, to the rest of the world and again Chinese flowers Chinese flowers have invaded the world uh, if you look at your garden you'll probably find it's 90 percent um, Chinese plants uh, hydrangeas buddleias chrysanthemums peonies they're all Chinese um, and here we've got uh, chrysanthemums and a peony, which are highly symbolic in Chinese culture. Uh, so chrysanthemums represent long life, um, yeah, long life, longevity and happiness and prosperity, um, and also wine. 
and the peonies represent also represent prosperity, happiness, um, and so on. Uh, so I will leave my talk there and invite questions. Thank you. Um, can I stop share? Okay, I'll just stop the sharing. Thank you. And ask everybody to unmute. Sorry, I've come out of my screen. So if, if you want me to go back into the slides, I'll have to screen share again. Okay, okay. Uh, we've still got quite a few people who have not uh, unmuted. Colin, David, um, Gregor. <coughs> <clears throat> Robin there we go getting there okay right we're almost almost set can I can I can I kick off David Good By, uh, I, you you've asked me to give the vote of thanks but I would start off at this point by saying to Val um, I would like to apologize mm. for having had to ask you to <laughs> cover such a vast subject in such a short time. Uh, there, you, there is so much to talk about. Uh, you haven't mentioned Chinese films, for instance. There are massive area, areas to, to be covered. Uh, so I suppose my first question might be, are you proposing to offer a series of workshops, classes, lectures, which uh, those of us who are interested might attend? I know that you play a role with the Scotland China Association, but I wonder if you're still doing that sort of thing locally. Well, locally is irrelevant nowadays, isn't it, with Zoom? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, I'm, it's, <coughs> you know, I am retired. <laughs> so, <laughs> theoretically. Yeah. Well, uh, could, could I, I, I spent, could I just say briefly that I, I spent quite a bit of time in China in the 80s and the early 90s, thanks to the Scotland China Association and then onward to other parts of my life. And what I observed was the, the idealism that's portrayed in these stamps, um, an idealism which was far removed from the reality of, of the lives of the people that I lived among when I was living in China. I taught English in a university there for a short while. Uh, but the, the reality in the long term now has really come to pass. And um, I haven't been to China since uh, the late 90s, but I, I understand that uh, the level of advancement in cities and industry all over China is, is enormous and has, has probably over, greatly overtaken us in the West. I don't know about a comparison with Germany or France, but certainly uh, it makes uh, Britain look a bit dusty. Um, so I would, I would ask Val, um, uh, the big question in everybody's mind now, is President Xi, in your opinion, setting himself up to be another emperor, another dictator, and what effect might that have on China as, as it uh, develops? Ooh. <laughs> that's, that's a huge question. Um, I think, yes, he, you know, not to, to be quite blunt, yes, uh, he, um, he is a lifetime dictator, basically, now. Um, so, but the, the point you made about the idealism uh, is still there and it's quite interesting because this is what drives Chinese society or has and certainly has done since the 1940s um, it's now called the China dream uh, you may have come across this expression what is the China dream the Chinese hasten to say it's completely different from the American dream uh, the China dream is basically about owning your own house sending your children to university um, becoming wealthy. So it's basically about wealth, which is very, very different from the ideals you saw in mid 20th century, uh, when it was the ideal was fair food and income for everybody. Uh, you know, they, when I was in China, many, many people um, 
But, you know, for example, even in universities, we had a concrete floor, um, a single light bulb. Uh, there were no fridges, virtually no TVs. <coughs> and, you know, life was very, very hard. If you lived in the countryside, you had a mud floor, you know, which you swept every day. You had, a, you know, the toilets were outside. And um, so it was a very different idealism then. It was all about becoming an equal society and being... Well, I when I was in Beijing, for instance, mm -hmm. even in Beijing, uh, in the mid-80s, towards the end of the 80s, I saw women with bound feet. So yeah. uh, medieval. Yes, I, I think you probably won't see bound feet now. Not, no, no. Still, traditional families were still binding feet until about the 1920s. Uh, so you would see, and then there were the unfortunate cases of the women who'd had their feet unbound. Uh, so you could, would see half-size deformed feet sometimes. Yeah. But, yeah. but um, it's been out. It was outlawed, I think, in 1911 with the coming of the Republic. Um, so it's you know it's and it was only among Han women. It wasn't amongst uh, national minorities. Uh -huh. I don't want to hog it, but one, just one other point I might ask you about. Uh, I was uh, I was very impressed in China by their currency, the the notes, which also carried um, propaganda, as you might say, certainly idealized visions of China on the on the notes. Beautiful, art, beautiful artwork. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. So wonderful socialist realist artwork. It's changed a bit. I think they're a bit more boring now. Um, <laughs> and I think, if, in fact, cash is becoming uh, redundant in China. Um, I was last in China in 2019. Yeah, 2019. And I found it incredibly hard to buy theatre tickets um, because I had, you had to do it on your phone, which meant setting up a Chinese bank account, etc., etc., which was ridiculous because I was only there for a few weeks and, uh, and so what I had to do was I had to go along and buy unwanted tickets from people in the queue who decided they didn't want to go um, but it was uh, you know um, even then three years ago cash was becoming irrelevant in China and in fact beggars then were um, had card readers and when I was in Xiamen, I think Xiamen was my 2013, the Buddhist monks, because they, you know, they beg um, but with their arms bold, they also had um, card readers. Uh -huh. Well, another terribly general question leading on from that, would you recommend to our viewers here in this exercise, uh, holidays in China, where would you recommend visiting? Um, personally, I, I've never been to China for a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I don't know. I think, I think if it's new to you, it would be interesting in, in that oh, new place is interesting. Uh, but China, the cities are huge, noisy, modern. You, you see a Chinese culture of a very different nature. I mean, they're different. They're different from uh, European cities. Uh, but you see a very different China. Um, it's a very consumer, it's a consumer society. Um, a and of course, Chinese people love eating, you know, so <laughs> eating is paramount in Chinese culture. But there are lots of things, you know, cinema and all sorts of things. Um, if you want a sort of, if you want traditional China, you've got to go quite a long way to find it. Thousands of miles, really. Because the cities are now so huge, you know, if you if you travel out from Shanghai or Beijing, it's just endless urbanization. Um, people like to build um, onion tower mansions in their rice fields. Uh, you know, they 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 don't have little cottages anymore on farms, so they have sort of um, magnificent uh, Tudor mansions or uh, Russian onion tower mansions. Yes. One child policy. Oh? How about the one child policy? Has that not. Uh... That doesn't exist now. No, it's a three child policy now because yeah. uh, 
China, like many other nations, is in danger of not reproducing itself. <clears throat> and women, women don't want to have babies. They want to go out to work and enjoy themselves. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, why saddle yourselves with children? Um, and I don't know if you know, but Korea uh, now is is um, under reproducing. Uh, every woman has 0.9 children in uh, in Korea. It's interesting, Val. They, they, you know, we're seeing you were showing us of the stamps, the the, the kind of propaganda mm. angle to those early stamps. Uh, are the more modern stamps similarly still propaganda based? Uh, sadly, China has also gone over to this sort of standard post office mark. You know, because they have to have barcodes and so on now. You know, you ha how often do you, if you have a personal letter? <laughs> but they still they, and they love the the historic um, depictions and, and anniversaries, of course, of camera anniversaries. It's very like stamps in any country. I think if you look closely at um, the stamps of any nation, they are in its, in essence propaganda because you have significant anniversaries uh, of people, um, scientists, artists, politicians, etc. For example, Shakespeare, we would always put Shakespeare on stamps. That's uh, Shakespeare is part of British soft power, just as Burns is part of Scottish soft power. Um, and of course, the, the ancient poets of China are all part of the soft power. Were you aware, I mean, I, I've only been to Beijing, Hong Kong, Beijing, so I haven't traveled widely in China at all. But um, the one impression I did come away with was that I was still an object of some curiosity. Uh, this would have been back. <laughs> uh, I think it's not nearly so bad now. And I've got a wonderful photograph from I think from in nineteen. The very first time I went to China was nineteen seventy three, and that was with um, a Scotland China Association delegation. And I've got this wonderful photo uh, when we we came out of a hotel in Zhengzhou which is it's quite a big city, it's got a population of three or four million, uh, but it's regarded as a rural city, you know, it's a long way from the, it's sort of in central China. And uh, we came out of the hotel and there was a group of thousands of Chinese people watching the hotel doors, waiting for the foreigners to come out. And in fact, um, people used to do this in Beijing, and uh, the uh, did, did you stay in the Beijing Hotel, the big one at the end of? Uh, there was one near near uh, the, near Tiananmen Square, not far from Tiananmen Square. You know, the once upon a time it was the only hotel room, um, but it had automatic doors, it had sliding doors, and many people, would, especially children, would stand and watch for hours as the doors slid back and the foreigners went in and out. Um, and I think certainly when I was there, um, foreigners were regarded as rather peculiar. Well, you, you, have, you know, some people have never seen a foreigner, uh, and unless their their grandparents might have seen missionaries. You know, missionaries were very present in China in the early twentieth, late nineteenth, early twentieth century. So you have villages where people were accustomed to seeing them. Um, but foreigners were unusual because, uh, partly because um, the doors, well, they didn't slam shut, but China was not really open to the outside world during those early years of the People's Republic. Um, While you've been on these visits, looking back to uh, to Western Europe, do, do you see the example of propaganda from us going towards them? Because the Chinese and the Russians both uh, spend a great deal of money on their soft propaganda, their quiet propaganda. You get in touch with any of these uh, organizations based either in China or Russia, and you will be deluged with material, free and glossy and expensive very often. Uh, do you see that in China from us? Yeah, I think we do, but I don't think we do it to the same extent because we just have the idealism. You know, China and Russia have this idealistic, nationalistic, patriotic, approach to their nation, which we simply don't. I mean, we're, we're all cynical. You can see from the way we treat our leaders, um, that we're, 
we're very cynical we're cynical not modest necessarily but i think um europeans are much more um open they're, they're much more acknowledging their faults and we don't advertise ourselves in the way that maybe we ought to i don't know you know and i think this is changing slightly because i notice uh, teaching European students as opposed to Chinese students, European students are learning to sell themselves, you know, to blow their trumpet, um, which Chinese people, and if there's this myth about Chinese people being modest and, you know, self-effacing and all the rest of it, um, they do that for a purpose, as we do. You know, there, there are moments when you want to be diplomatic or you want to pretend and you do it. But the Chinese as a nation, I'm not talking about individuals, but as a nation, uh, are very good at being patriotic, nationalistic, idealistic, and um, self-advertising. So I think it's there, it's certainly there. And of course, when we send our athletes to the Olympics, our medal score is our soft power. Yes, yeah, yeah, interesting. Right. Any other questions, David? All these these stamps appear to have, or majority of them appear to have a number eight on them. Is it a number eight? And why no. should it be number eight on all the stamps? It's it's the price of the stamp, the definitive value, uh, eight eight fun. So it's probably worth about. In those days, it would have been probably less than a halfpenny. Um, but Chinese money has changed. I didn't go into this because of the, the time limitations. But if you look closely at the stamps, you'll see that the early values are in the hundreds. Yeah, yeah. Values are single figures. But they're the same, they're letter stamps, the same. And that was because uh, during the 30s and 40s, China had massive inflation. Uh, I think in the 1930s, you had to take a wheelbarrow full of notes to buy bread or rice. Um, and so they were in the hundreds. But then in the early 50s, China revalued uh, to make Chinese money more sensible. Um, you, sorry, uh, you, you, you've shown us sets of stamps. Yes. Now, a set of stamps in the UK would, would, uh, be, would include several values. Yes. All these stamps seem to be the same value, and I couldn't understand that. Um, no, they would just do the same. I think you wouldn't have quite so many, um, because China was then a less sophisticated society, you wouldn't have as many different values. Um, and of course, you can always put the stamps on. Um, but they were <laughs> in the same set, but you had one set, you know, with, with various different uh, motifs on the same value. Um, and also, I don't know, again, some of you will have been to China from a post office. Um, up until very recently, you go into the post office and there's a pot of glue and you paste your stamp and stick it on. Um, and uh, But now I think they have the self adhesives. And as I say, you have this sort of um, barcoding, which is replacing postage stamp, which I think is very, very sad. Well, I remember that, Val. I remember when I was in China, sending letters by the dozen because I was very homesick home. And I remember in the 80s having to go through that process that you're talking about. And it was a terrible guddle. It was an awful mess and incredibly inefficient. So I'm quite surprised that, it's, uh, that that system hung on for so long. It hung on until fairly recently. I mean, I can't give you a but sort of... Probably years ago. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else want to ask a question? I was I was wondering if um, the writing on the the stamps of the Chinese characters I, you can make out that one of the sets is obviously saying China, I presume. But do the the other inserts of Chinese say anything? Yeah. You well again. I didn't I didn't cover this because of time limitation. But if you look at a single stamp, um, you have the definitive value, 
uh, you have a Chinese People's Republic uh, post office, general post office, you have that label. And then if, the, if there's a theme to the stamp, so for example, um, 10th anniversary of the People's Congress, that will be on it too. And then at the very bottom, in the two bottom corners, you have the series number and the date. So they will have a series number and, and a date. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I was going to say about the writing is that, you, again, you, you see a change. You see language reform happening in those stamps. Uh, the early ones, the 19, 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, early 50s, are all written in traditional Chinese characters, what we call hu or traditional. In the mid-1950s, the, the characters were reformed to make them simpler. Not every character, but most characters were reformed. So you've got two different writing styles. From the mid-50s on, it's in simplified characters. So you have a change in the money, you have a change in the writing, which illustrates a new China. Very oh, interesting. Can I, can I, can I say that I taught quite a lot of students at Heriot Watt University and the accounting and nowadays almost all of the big companies have two sets of accounts. They have the financial stuff and they have something called social and environmental accounting and that's a big glossy booklet. And it was my job to refer to these. And I lost them quite often, the, the Chinese students, when I was going on about the contents of social and environmental publications. Their eyes glassed over like a teddy bear, and they became polite listeners. But they, they didn't understand about that, about excellent treatment of workers, mm -hmm. about the environment, about improvement of conditions and image uh, in that level, the you know, environmental study. And I was quite nervous about it because I often found myself wanting to say, and, and this is the way you should be doing it. Ah, and <clears throat> all sorts of instincts came in don't do that, because that's not why they're here, to listen to Scottish propaganda about mm -hmm. the health of the rivers mm -hmm. and how our companies look after that kind of thing. So although it was my job to cover that, I did it in a very light way. <clears throat> and, and also I had to be very careful about the word profit and our a financial structure is all embedded in, in profit making. Uh, so it was a, a tricky situation in Edinburgh. And a, they were very wealthy, these students, and they were the children of officials, high up officials and military people. And they, I just had to watch carefully what I was doing and try to steer away from profit and a healthy air and so on. Uh, the other thing I noticed was they don't, they're not immutable. They smile a great deal and laugh a great deal, probably bat me. And it's <laughs> very amusing because the first five minutes they had to try and discover if they could understand my Scottish accent they never faced a Scottish lecturer before, and it was quite good. And after a couple of minutes, they began to realize that they could actually understand what I was saying. <laughs> but every so often, I would introduce Ok or some <laughs> such thing, just to unstabilize them in case I was going away mm. from the text. But uh, I just did that occasionally. But uh, very, very pleasant students, but I had to be very careful because when they went back to China, what did your Scottish lecturers talk about? Tell us what they said. And I, and I just, I was never officially warned 
but occasionally I could read between the lines. Just be very careful what you're about. <clears throat> okay. No, that's very interesting. Um, because I've been teaching Chinese students for the last 20 years, and I found that, that and European students, so you know, you see um, the difference, but I found in the last 20 years, Chinese students have changed enormously. Um, when I first started teaching them, they wouldn't say boo to a goose. Um, but now they know their rights. They're very aware of environment, environmental issues. Um, they're delighted to talk about profits and losses. Um, and most of them are mathematically very literate. You know, it's a very important subject in China. Um, and in fact, they start education very early. So I have heard horror stories of four-year-olds uh, learning Pi to 48 digits. Um, yeah. You know, horrific stories. But they are, you know, they are mathematically highly trained in most cases. And of course, now China is much more environmentally aware. Um, and certain, I mean, everything in China revol revolves around profit. Um, yeah. Yeah, the other thing I noticed was at the beginning of my experience, they all had European names. Susie, Fiona, uh, and that's been stopped. Mm. And they're now told, use your Chinese name. Mm. And don't convert when you're, and I had to struggle, of course, with the uh, learning Chinese, mm. shall I say, four names instead of Christian names. Mm. Um, and that was something um, they, they must have been told. And don't change to European when you're over in Edinburgh. But no need. Okay. Is there anybody else? Uh, I think we'll bring the questioning to an end then. And I'll ask Gregor to give a uh, vote of thanks. Thank you, Gregor. Um, now, you, I know. Gregor, you have the temptation to range across the whole of Chinese life, history, society. <laughs> <laughs> well, all, all, I, what can I say? Uh, Val, uh, the, the subject is, is very well chosen. When it was suggested first, I thought, well, stamp collecting is, is, uh, is niche. Uh, perhaps uh, we won't attract as many people as we would like. But the, the, the use of the stamps has been a terrific way of uh, engendering interest in the vast range of life in China as it appeared and as it changed dramatically throughout the 50s and the 60s um, and to, to the way it is nowadays. Uh, your, your talk's been hugely interesting, including the last few minutes particularly. I, I must say, that um, the, the indigenous Chinese living in this country regard the, the young Chinese who come over here as spoiled brats. <laughs> and uh, many thanks, Val. That was really, really interesting. And um, all I can say is I hope we're going to have you back next year to talk to us face to face at the Maitland Field Hotel because you've got so much more to tell us. Many thanks. Thank you. Yep. Here, here. Thank, thank you very much, indeed, Gregor, and, and thank you, Val. That you're right. I mean, it, it's a colossal subject, and that we could have roamed far and wide. Uh, but I'd like to thank you very much personally, uh, especially for stepping in at short notice. That was very good of you. Thank you very much. Um, just a couple of things before we bring the meeting to an end. Uh, one is that we that Russell is confirming that 1981 was indeed the start date of Probus, Haddington Probus. And the other thing is that uh, email, an email will come out uh, uh, inviting people to apply for Miller Hill. That's from Ian. Anything else anybody wants to add before I close down? Could I just ask, you said uh, email will come from Ian yes. about Miller Hill. Did I mishear you earlier when you said that um, members should email Probus to say if they wanted to come. Yes, no, you, you're quite right. Uh, I said originally you can email me through Probus account, uh, but Ian is going to send out just a, 
a kind of confirmatory uh, invitation because obviously we don't have all the members uh, on Zoom this morning. So just to give them the chance to, to join in. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, our next meeting, Yoho, will be back in the Maitland Field um, on the 7th of February. The speaker will be announced when we find one. <laughs> um, it seemed, we seem to be going through a rocky patch of, uh, uh, of speakerdom. Uh, but anyway, we'll sort that out in due course. But thank you very much indeed again, Val. Yeah, that's been a super talk. Very much enjoyed that. And I'll say have a happy week, happy fortnight to everybody, and we'll see you in the Maitland Field in due course. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye everybody. Not only a few people that are at the top that are